Marcus, I guess I, I think, guess I'm going to kick it off here. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, welcome, everyone. I uh, appreciate you joining us tonight. And what Marcus and I intend to do is tell you what we've been doing for the past year at the Naval Academy in establishing a wargaming initiative. Uh, and we'll kick off with a couple of bios. I have been teaching it, well, until two weeks ago, I've been teaching it. The Naval Academy in both political science and history departments. I was director of the museum for nine years, worked for two senators, uh, ONR, Office of Naval Intelligence, a couple other places, commander in the Navy Reserve, Intel, uh, deployed a few times, and uh, also an author. Uh, so Marcus, over to you for your bio. Thanks, Claude. Um, <clears throat> for folks who, uh, I see a, a few names that I recognize. I won't bore you overly much, I hope. I've been at the Naval Academy since 2004. I came here from Yale University where I taught for a while and took my degrees. I am a historian of uh, modern Germany by background. In addition to being a historian of modern Germany, I teach U.S. naval history and have migrated somewhat intellectually into the field of naval history over the last few years. Uh, the natural evolution, I guess, being at the Naval Academy. Um, I think the long and the short of it is that I've used war games episodically in the past, unsystematically for pedagogical purposes in the classroom and found them to be uh, stunningly insightful, not necessarily from the point of view of rigorously accurate history or from the point of view of uh, <laughs> rigorously accurate conflict simulation or modeling, but but from the point of view of their unique ability to, to integrate into the student's mind um, aspects of what it is you're trying to teach that 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 may come across disparately or or in an incoherent fashion. They're very powerful, I found, for capturing student interest and for helping to clarify lots of concepts which um, we we otherwise spend a, a good bit of time in the classroom talking about. Um, Claude and I uh, have a long-standing relationship, and it was the uh, most natural thing in the world uh, at one point or another to talk about wargaming and our mutual interest in it. Um, and it made good sense to uh, merge our efforts and to push um, into the unknown, so to speak, to, to, to try to carve out at an already very crowded institution uh, the opportunity to create chances for midshipmen to experience wargaming, to try to develop it in a way that makes it useful for the mission and for the purposes it can serve in the classroom, especially in the uh, what we call the HH-104, the Naval History Core Course, which all midshipmen take in their first year at the Naval Academy. Uh, not necessarily just for that course, but uh, primarily, at least initially. And to provide a, a framework within which uh, the midshipmen can uh, war game together, can do so on their own through an extracurricular activity, as Claude's going to uh, talk a little bit about here coming up and to provide support and to some extent guidance along those lines. We have an extraordinary, extraordinary brigade of midshipmen, lots of very, very bright and promising young people full of potential. And this seems to have found quite a bit of interest among them, very surprising amount of interest. I'll pass it yeah. back to Claude. And I, I think uh, the fact that Marcus and I had been, had both been longtime gamers helped in this initiative as well. You know, my, my experience goes back to the early 1980s with the old metagaming series. You know, I think my first game was Fury of the Norsemen, and that was followed up by Ram Speed, Fire When Ready, and Warp Wars, and uh, a metagaming one called Command at Sea, which I still use for class. And then uh, migrated over to games like Diplomacy, which we all called the Little Box of Hate, uh, and was very <laughs> successful at learning how to hate a lot. Everybody learned how to hate after about five hours. Um, so we're going to talk about why we developed this and what we found with the midshipmen at the Naval Academy. And I start with this quote. It's actually by, by Sebastian. After the first time we, we ran a game, the midshipmen were having a lot of fun. And I mentioned that to, to Sebastian. I said, look how much fun they're having at, at, you know, looking at the South China Sea and the problems of China and the United States. And Sebastian just looked at me and says, don't tell them they're learning. They won't like it. So we just tell them they're having fun. Next slide. Naval Wargaming has a spotted history at best at the Naval Academy. You'd think we were right deep in it, but that's not our role or responsibility. That's largely the role of the Naval War College. And we certainly didn't want to duplicate that 
so there have been little things here and there. If you look at the 1930s, there was a, a game called Pigskin. Tom Hamilton was a, a Naval Academy football player, later coach. And they, uh, they had a game. That's the one on the lower right-hand side. We've actually, at the museum, which until I left two weeks ago, we were actually thinking of reissuing that. And we're working with somebody. Uh, but we've put that in abeyance for now. Um, and then looking at this issue, I, I uh, learned from the archivist at the Naval Academy that there was a history professor who left a lot, a lot of papers. And there was something about wargaming. And he said, you really ought to check this at some point. So I spent a couple of days in the archives looking through Professor Russell's papers of late 1960s, which included all of his course material. It included student assessments. And what he was doing in especially 66, 67, 68 was using uh, Gettysburg uh, and the old Gettysburg game, but he was also developing games for his midshipmen in class, specifically what we would call today coin counterinsurgency operations. It was a game that was very similar to what they might find in Vietnam. So Russell's intent was to get his midshipmen ready for what they would face in the next year. And that's exactly what happened. In fact, the, the notes were so detailed, I started tracking down the students who were in that course. And I found about four or five of them and interviewed several and had some great insights from that. All of them remembered that class. The reason they remembered the lessons of that history class were because of the game, not because of the books, not because of any other materials that might've been available, the lectures. They said it was the games that put it all together for them. In fact, there was one, uh, General Mike uh, Williams, who was a, a former assistant commandant of the Marine Corps, four-star. I interviewed him about six months ago as well for the uh, Preble Hall Naval History Podcast. You can hear a little bit about his comments on on gaming, but I mostly interviewed him about Operation Sea Signal, which he commanded in the mid-90s off of uh, Guantanamo Bay. But he said, you know, what we really learned is logistics. And he says, that's why I went into logistics as a Marine. I, I recall the lessons of that one particular class. In the 1980s, uh, OPPO 3 at the Pentagon sponsored a computerized game uh, and they had some machines set up over in Loose Hall, which is where the seamanship and navigation and leadership departments are located at the Naval Academy. And they would have competitions between the various companies. And again, I spoke to several officers, uh, some of whom were just recently retired as captains, and they found value in being able to use these as well. But the la latest iteration is what we hope will be the enduring iteration, and certainly Sebastian has been a huge part of this, and that is the Naval History Wargaming Initiative between the History Department and the United States Naval Academy Museum. So why would we do that? I'll talk about leveraging assets later on. Next slide, please. Uh, before you move Go on, I, yeah, yeah. I think we'd be remiss not to uh, not to mention the effort in the uh, late 2000 aughts by a, a couple of officer faculty in the math department, uh, operations research department as well, Kyle Clewer. And Rich Forrest taught a capstone course, a highly regarded capstone course on mathematics and wargaming, in which uh, they they mapped out the the intricate interrelationship between wargaming and key concepts in mathematics, and especially in operations research, the mathematical underpinnings to to OR. Um, the, the two of them have since moved on and, and work professionally in, in related fields, but but I think that that's probably the most recent instantiation of wargaming on anything like a curricular level, a serious level at the Naval Academy. And it was unfortunately episodic, but they've been they've been enormously helpful in reaching out. Thanks, Marcus. Next slide. All right, so here is our mission. Uh, we want to provide wargaming opportunities to the midshipmen as well as other individuals. And we had uh, the intent to have uh, this um, three-legged stool of wargaming at the academy. The first was to establish a formal three credit course that was formally taught by Marcus and Sebastian was uh, the instructor for that and that we just completed it first semester. And I think it, it really goes to the interest of midshipmen because that course basically sold out in under four minutes, which I understand from uh, Marcus was one of the, I think it may be the record on what an elective would, would fill in. I'm not sure if that's something we can verify, but it was awfully fast. <laughs> we're, we're verifying it here right yeah, now. Surprisingly fast. Yeah. <laughs> 
Uh, so we'll talk more about that. The second was to establish an extracurricular activity in ECA at the Naval Academy. And this would hit a broader audience because we understood that formal three credit course would only have about 15 to 17 students. We really needed to, it really needed to reach out to the midshipmen to have an impact. Unfortunately, we had two extraordinary midshipmen. They're both uh, third class midshipmen, rising second class. If you're outside of the military service academies, that means they're soft, uh, sorry, they're juniors, sophomores heading into their junior years of college. The third part of this was, has really been delayed due to COVID. Uh, and this was to host quarterly weekends for Navy reservists, active Navy and midshipmen to work together for an entire weekend. The reason for this is because this really came out of a reserve weekend. Uh, I mentioned I'm a, a Navy reservist and about a year and a half ago, a month before COVID really shut everything down, I was at a reserve intelligence leadership symposium. And in, in the unclassified environment, people were talking about, wow, we really need to get to, back to war games and understand blue forces, red forces, et cetera. But war gaming kept coming up in conversations. And that's when I decided uh, when kicking some ideas around with Marcus on projects we could work on, that's when we really kicked this off. So what I wanted to do was integrate a lot of the reservists and I had been working with the Chief Navy Reserves Office as well as uh, CNEFR, which is Chief Naval Information Force Reserve. We were getting ready to board uh, applicants kind of like what you would do is if, you, if you're in the reserves and you're in the apply board or JO apply, you wanna either uh, get an COXO billet or a particular billet. That's what they were gonna do with this. So now that COVID looks like it's gonna be lifting in the mm, sometime future, we'll probably go back to this. So how are we gonna do this? First of all, we had to establish a space. And fortunately, the museum had a, a theater and I decided to convert it to at least some sort of basic space that we could use for midshipmen, for teaching class, for weekend and evening war games, something pretty simple. We didn't go high tech. We were, we're and eventually we're gonna get uh, a little more advanced, but we really wanted to focus on tabletop games rather than computerized games for the most part, uh, only because we wanted the midshipmen to understand the uh, design and mechanics of, of games and also the history of the games. The second part of that was the museum had funding. Uh, we, as director of the museum, I had, I won't call it a slush fund, but I had some funds that could be used for special projects and this became one. And third, the Naval Academy Museum has a, an extremely large mo ship model collection on all, all sizes. I mean, we've got an entire deck devoted just to British dockyard models that are up to 350 years old. But we also have uh, the old war gaming models uh, and a lot of one to uh, 700 scale and one to 1200. We've got 6,000 one to 1200 scale models. Most of those uh, represent World War II ships, but we also have other opportunities as well, we learned. And that included working with, Marcus, was it Mecky that was looking at 3D printing uh, some of the models that we didn't have of, of some Pre of the battles? Precisely, uh, yeah. Captain Brad Baker is a permanent military professor in the mechanical engineering department, and he is uh, on the bleeding fringe of additive manufacturing uh, methodology and, and engineering. Yeah. And the last part is the history department itself, Marcus's shop, and uh, we had to have some sort of formal co course that was not, uh, through the Naval Academy Museum, we had no structure for that. So the partnering became logical. Uh, Marcus, any other thoughts on this slide? No, no, not specifically. Okay. It uh, represents, I think, in the context of initial efforts, a pretty ambitious program when you think about it, but uh, all of the different elements are, are intended to complement and, and reinforce each other. Um, and I think they do it well, primarily by virtue of the fact that um, that the midshipmen themselves have demonstrated an incredibly high degree of enthusiasm. Many of them were mystified that we weren't already doing this on some level, if not really intensively at the Naval Academy. And it, it seems like the most, the, most natural, uh, the most natural kind of activity. That's true. Uh, I taught a Naval history course that's designed for our international students. So in my class, I had any, you know, midshipmen from Romania, uh, Rwanda, um, South Korea, et cetera. And I remember one of the midshipmen on, upon hearing this, he said, wow, this is one of the reasons we applied to the academy when we got here, we realized that there was nothing like this. So this is the first time we're seeing this. Next slide, please, Sebastian. 
All right, well, we had to kick it off somewhere. Uh, this is historic Mahan Hall. It is one of the oldest buildings on the yard built uh, during the Beaux-Arts period at the Naval Academy when it was really uh, built up between uh, 1895 and 1905. That's the big period. Uh, the room you see on the right-hand side, that is what used to be the library. It is now called the Heart Room. It's a massive room on that uh, third deck of Mahan where you see all the windows on the left. So the reason why we, we kicked things off here was number one, the, the museum's theater hadn't yet been converted. We were still working on it. Marcus and I were working on it on weekends to chip and paint and remove things and put things up and move tables, et cetera. Not the vision uh, of faculty that people customarily have. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Indiana Jones never had to go through that, I'm sure, um, just grading papers. The, uh, but the room afforded us during a COVID environment to, to have midshipmen play the game in a way we would not have, even if we had had the, the uh, wargaming room available in the, in the uh, museum. Next slide, please. So the first game was Assassin's Mace. And thanks to, to Sebastian for running that. That was back uh, seven months ago now, six, seven months ago, yeah, seven months ago. Um, and the mid, the, keep in mind, these are midshipmen, most of them who had never played a war game before. In fact, in this crew, I don't think they, they had. They were just a hodgepodge of midshipmen that we were able to pick up for this. And at the end of- Plebes, they were plebes. Uh, oh, sorry, you're right, they were yeah. plebes. No, first plebes. year, absolutely untutored. Uh, there was one who was a firsty somewhere because they were the ones I was talking, that was the person I was talking to with this next quote. Uh -huh. And at the end of it, they said, I learned more about joint, joint operations and capabilities in three hours than I had in three years. And all the, and speaking to the plebes who had just come through, uh, oh shoot, was it pro, uh, pro knowledge? Pro they had just done yeah. a week on surface warfare. And like the firsty said, yep, we didn't know about this. But by the end of three hours, I think Marcus and Sebastian will attest to, they were playing on the level of any other senior officer who would be introduced to this game anywhere, whether it's at Quantico or, or another site. Sebastian, for those probably one or two people who don't know what Assassin's Mace is, could you, could you add a few, a few remarks about it? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So Assassin's Mace is the first module in a, a wider system of game system developed by uh, Mick Will's Wargaming Division down at Marine Corps Base Quantico. Its lead designers were Colonel Tim Barrett, who was the director until recently in his retirement um, of the Wargaming Division at Quantico. And his uh, co-designer was Mark Gelson, who still works there as a contractor. Assassin's Mace is an Indo-Pacific modern war game at the or mid operational level where players must command CSGs, large naval formations, squadrons um, against a modern Chinese Navy and Air Force. Um, it ha has lots of great aspects to it. It abstracts a little bit of cyber and satellite and ISR. Uh, it's been a fantastic tool for the midshipmen to really start thinking about, you know, I mean, the theater of war and theater of competition. Uh, the game is modular, so you can have different types of scenarios. Uh, for this game, we did, we did a nine dash line scenario where crisis could potentially break out into conflict. Uh, unsurprisingly, the midshipmen went to conflict, right? <laughs> uh, and there was many a missiles a sling. Uh, but there are different ones where you can do stuff like um, submarine operations, uh, competition in maritime security, or a conventional uh, theater conflict. So it's a pretty adaptable game. And Colonel Tim Barrett um, and Mark did a fantastic job on the game. They are recently going to publish a new module for um, using the same system called OWS uh, for, for Europe called Zapod, um, and that should be coming out soon. Yeah, what's really striking about it is not necessarily that it teaches them what real warfare in the modern age is supposed to resemble. Uh, and I, I don't think any of them were, were dim enough to make the assumption that the game they were playing is a representation of reality. Rather, it, it provided them with the first insight into how complicated making decisions in, in circumstances characterized by so much complexity, so much uncertainty, uh, so much potential consequence, but also the sheer scale of those decisions, um, the amount of space to be covered, the, the, the different ways in which assets interrelate and, and combine to create capabilities. And it was really quite striking to see them wrestle with that 
and then for so much of it to come together in their minds after a couple of hours, um, many of them were really enthusiastic about what they felt they were learning. And that, that's kind of, it was an eye-opening experience for me as well that way. Next slide, please. Next game we played uh, was General Quarters and really appreciated all the help we got from folks at Rand who were taking time off their Saturdays to help midshipmen. And again, uh, just another uh, rule set and Sebastian can talk uh, briefly about this one. Uh, but again, keep in mind, we were under uh, real limitations because of COVID. Uh, so we were very fortunate that the Academy allowed us to move forward uh, during this, this period. We had a lot of the games that were actually canceled as a result in, in the fall. Uh, but this was a, a scenario of a Battle of the Atlantic. And I, if I remember, what was it near? Uh, was this one? Near, this was in Norway between uh, the, the Allies and the Germans, correct? Yeah, interdiction of northern convoy routes to Murmansk. Yeah, the midshipmen loved the cotton balls that were used for the, uh, the smoke screen. Uh, next slide. So uh, before we sorry. go to the next slide, uh, so General Quarters is a naval miniature system that uh, it's pretty easy to use. It's um, pretty basic in terms of what kind of things you have to consider is rate of fire, uh, things like range of fire, accuracy. Uh, you can do really uh, cool stuff like smoke um, and anti-submarine warfare. Torpedoes are pretty nascent in this, um, in this one because it is prior to war, uh, uh, prior to really the advances of uh, torpedo warfare, but the students really have to do a great job on coordinating between their fleet actions and uh, really having a plan. Uh, and it's really fantastic to see the midshipmen do that. Next slide. Now, not all of the uh, games were, were tabletop games. In this case, Pete Pellegrino ran Battle Trafalgar uh, just last month. And I think he did that twice for our midshipmen. And we included we about 24 midshipmen who were participating in each battle, taking command of each ship. And the same was true with that last slide you saw. He, that was the nice part is that the midshipmen would have to break off into teams and each of them had a ship they were in control of. They had to make decisions that they also had to co uh, coordinate with their Commodore. So it was a real uh, lessons in leadership as well and working with other people. Next slide. Now this is this is what I would think was a, a what I think was a turning point for this effort, because we had a midshipman who had participated in one of the games and approached me and said, "Sir, do you think that the museum could be open on a Friday night and a Saturday?" I was like, "Well, sure. I'll I'll come in myself. I'll buy pizzas, uh, and midshipmen always arrive when you have pizzas." But they were going to come over anyway. So this midshipman actually had been wargaming for several years and was just looking for the for an opportunity to work with other midshipmen. So here I witnessed uh, a midshipman using Fletcher Pratt's Naval War Game. They did the Battle of Java Sea. In our war game lab, we, or war game room, uh, we have some, some cases set up with uh, major battles. Uh, let's see, we have several major battles of World War II. We have Tsushima, uh, we have a couple of others. Uh, I think we have Santiago as well. So those are on the upper left-hand side, what you're seeing are the one to 1200 scale ship models that we have. And of course, the table wasn't large enough, so we went to the floor of the gallery. So in between all of these uh, centuries old British dockyard models, the midshipmen uh, are learning from other midshipmen. And they were there for about three hours on a Friday night. And then they did the same thing on a Saturday and a subsequent Friday night. All right, now I want you to put this in, uh, understand the, the perspective of this. This is April after we have been in a COVID environment for 13 months. For the most part, especially this, this past year, up, up to April 9th, about that time, midshipmen were basically in their rooms for 22 out of 24 hours a day uh, for about six or eight weeks just prior to that. They could have done anything that they wanted to with their time outside of Bancroft Hall, which is the, the only dormitory for midshipmen. The fact that, I think there were about uh, 12 or 13 on this one, the fact that midshipmen were coming to the museum on a Friday night and a Saturday to do this is an indication that they are hungry for learning about history and naval warfare and trying to apply that to their future careers. So that's what the, this, uh, this I think was a real big turning point in our understanding of what the needs were. 
Next slide, please. Marcus, do you have any? You weren't there for this one, but next slide. Thanks. Um, we again played General Quarters, and in this case, uh, the fictional Battle of Macassar. Uh, play, this is our wargaming lab. Again, it's not a large space, pretty basic, but um, again, midshipmen on a full Saturday, this is what they are choosing to do. May 1st, and if, if I recall, it was a, actually a very beautiful day, and their midshipmen are choosing to do this. Again, very, very fundamental uh, concept to, to understand when you're looking at what to provide in an educational environment and wargaming. Um, Marcus, or, uh, Marcus or Sebastian, you have any comments on this one? No, no, nothing specific. But it was interesting. I, I was just, I wasn't participating. I was just standing around listening to the comments of midshipmen. And you really see them picking it up, even only after a turn or so, that they are thinking about the consequences of their actions. What do I do if this happens? Do I have to consider this in, in, in the course of, uh, of, of these operations? So next slide, please. So before we jump to the next one, I'd like to point out two things. One is even in this photo, you can see the two midshipmen in the top or left-hand corner literally discussing about what they're thinking, what they should be doing, how should they react to the, uh, to the developing situation uh, on the map or on the naval uh, board. And the other portion is like this game was really fascinating to watch as a facilitator because – the U.S. coalition British side uh, represented by those ships on the left hand side um, coming towards so the center were like they had the numeric superiority, but they sort of fell down this tactical rabbit hole. They engaged the ship and they chased it down with a large formation of their uh, ship. While the Japanese largely stayed, they were disciplined. They stayed in their defensive formation. And in the end, the, def, uh, the Japanese side won because they, they got one very lucky with some of these torpedo long lances that they used. But more than anything, they stuck to their plan um, and deviated when they necessary. But the other side realized, and, and during the hot wash, they discussed, oh, that first ship that we engaged, it was, it was a rabbit hole. We were too out of position to then come back and swing around to mass enough fires. And it was a really fascinating discussion. And this is right before that engagement happens, as you see on the sort of uh, the midshipman with the white t-shirt pointing out his ships were the first ones to engage. And you see that the large chunk of the U.S. forces are flowing towards that direction. And they usually, and they didn't make it back in time for the rest of the battle. It was a really interesting uh, little tactical scenario to watch them play. Yeah, Sebastian, wasn't this the, the game though where there was just one Japanese destroyer which was getting, they were the, the, the Allied forces were attacking this one and it just wasn't getting hit or it was continuing to survive even when it was hit. And yet they continued to focus on that one destroyer rather than what was ahead of them. Yeah, absolutely. That's exactly what happened. Um, what you're in, they were engaging at far distances. So the first things that went out were like the surge slide and little things. And then even when they got some hull shots, it kept trucking along. And eventually it lost mobility uh, in steering. So it just sort of drifted, but it was too late by that point because they already sunk so much time and effort um, in chasing it down and to get real close to these ships to get effective fires. Uh, but yeah, that, and that's one of the things they learned. They're like, hey, beware of these like tactical rabbit holes, right? That you fall down and sort of get tunnel vision. Uh, and that's not something you can you can internalize by just reading about it. Or, oh, don't get tunnel vision. Of course, yeah, obviously, right? But then you feel it in your bones after, after you do it yourself. Next slide. I want to thank the Krulak Center because they were really helping us along the entire process. Uh, we had some questions about Assassin's Mace. They helped us with that. And they, they were just a phenomenal uh, leader in, in this whole effort and really appreciate what they did. So in return, we really tried to uh, help them out by uh, helping their students. I think, Sebastian, these were some of your students who had de designed games down at Quantico. So we had midshipmen who volunteered to play test. Again, on Saturdays, beautiful days when they could have gone to their sponsor families' homes or just hung out in Greater Annapolis. This is what they were doing. Next slide. And we're going to move on to the Naval History Wargaming course. This is the uh, first crew with Marcus and Sebastian. Uh, we had 15 initially, and I think two, we extended uh, the invitation to two more who really wanted to come into the course. They divided up into five teams uh, toward the beginning of the course. Next slide. Uh, and so 
at the by the end of the course, and I think Sebastian's talked about this before, and if you want to learn more either about that course or the other uh, efforts we did, especially in the fall, Marcus and Sebastian and I did a couple of episodes of the Preble Hall History Podcast, excuse me, Preble Hall History Podcast. That's available anywhere. So just look up Wargaming and Preble Hall Podcast. Uh, let's see, this was the, oh, this was Queen of Pirates. And I think, I think this was probably the most extensive they they seem to catch on pretty quickly this this team uh, and this seemed to be the most popular game to play this uh took place er, naval history uh early 19th century off the coast of china uh pirate queen who had a, about 70 or 80 thousand pirates uh, under her under her charge uh next slide and sebastian if you want to uh, just chime in on any of the aspects of the games because you guys were there on a day-to-day -day basis um, so I'll, t I'll talk briefly about some of the game mechanics uh, beyond the photos. So this game, uh, like Claude mentioned, is uh, largely at its heart a, move, a moon maneuver and logistics game. So both sides, uh, the Qing Navy and the, the Pirate Confederations, uh, represented by the Red Ships, have to essentially reach certain objectives, which is either amassing a, a significant fortune, uh, fortune uh, to retire as pirates or to inflict so much physical harm into the Pearl River Delta that the, the Chinese government must sue for peace, which is essentially the historical arc of this conflict. And the core real interesting as aspect of the game is whenever ships move on either side, they have to take food, they have to take supplies and the, and the, and the treasure must be taken back to the pirates uh, headquarters, right? Which is with the, the pirate queen's flagship. So it really becomes a, 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 a contest of who can supply their fleet at sea and in the Delta most effectively who can uh, stay on course. And obviously there are combat and such, but largely it's really focused about, you know, I mean, large fleet maneuvers within this very small note based uh, movement system. Excellent. And this one, oh, this was the, uh, was this Gallic War or was this, yeah, this was the Gallic War. I think this is where they were testing it before, so I couldn't see it. Um, Sebastian? So this one was about the Battle of Elysium during the Gallic Wars, where Julius Caesar and his uh, Roman legions were caught in a double siege, both uh, sieging the Gauls trapped inside, but also being seized themselves. And you can see the, the brown hexes represent the wall fortifications. This game is uh, very similar to uh, a defense siege game, <laughs> unsurprisingly, where the Roman pieces represented by the early uh, wooden sticks, they they eventually went to cubes uh, for the hexa sizes, but this is one of their early play tests during our, our class. And uh, the little, the towers represent the watchtower. So the Roman player has to maneuver his forces according to how the, the forces outside the external walls are essentially seizing them and trying to break into the wall. So the Romans really have to fight on dual fronts, which provides really interesting dynamics. As you see, the, the sea, there's not enough manpower across the walls. So the, so the Gauls are really trying to race against time and create enough pressure points to break through the walls. And that's in many cases they do. And the real question is, can they break through the second wall? Right. So it's really fascinating. Game. And I should point out that the final exam took place at the same time, uh, for all of the teams, and we and Sebastian brought in outside experts, uh, war, you know, war gamers from across uh, the Eastern Seaboard, really, uh, who could come over and provide their assessments for the midshipmen as they were as they were play testing what they had provided. So the feedback was immediate. And uh, next slide. Let's see, this one was uh, battled during the Battle of Normandy, correct? And over to you, Sebastian. This was about the Battle of Villers Bocage. So originally this group did the whole campaign and they were struggling with the size of the battle. So what they did is they actually broke the uh, the wider multi-day campaigns of Villers Bocage after the, the landings at Normandy that they broke it down into small segments or campaigns and modules. Um, and it's largely um, based on you know, individual tactical warfare about penetration, about weapon systems, about terrain, uh, cover and concealment. Uh, for those who recognize some of the map, that map is from Panzer. So when they were first using it, they used the, uh, the game map from Panzer as their first play testing um, sort of way to sort of feel out their mechanics. 
That was the most intricate of the games on a tactical level, I think. Yeah, absolutely. They did a lot of research about um, penetration and rounds. And I mean, uh, Jared, who you see standing up in, in the photo, they, he did a tremendous amount of research as he was going into it, into other games. He looked at other tactical game systems like Conflict of Heroes by Academy Games, but other uh, but also looked into the vehicles that were used and why they were used. And we had earlier on during the semester, uh, James Sterrett from Command General Staff College, um, come and talk to us and you're in, fortunate for us he's a world-class designer and ga uh, war gamer but he also uh, knows tremendously about this period of, of, of tank warfare and armor warfare and infantry warfare so it was really great for them to pick uh, at his brain during their presentations and their early design period yeah i also want to point out when i was talking to the midshipmen very very few of them in this class were history majors they were across the majors at the academy as many of whom have never, never played a war game before, uh, some of whom had only taken the basic naval history course. And it was really extraordinary to, to listen to them as they provided so much detail on these specific battles because they finally learned about them in the course of, of the semester. Next slide. And I'll, actually, I'm gonna take a real quick question. I just saw something come across the chat about how these things should be published. That we had actually been talking earlier this semester about uh, the museum funding some way to have have these available. We're working right now through our uh, JAG office, the lawyers to see because the midshipmen created these while they were on active duty. There's always some questions about what can be provided, what can't. Um, you know, certainly that uh, some can be provided uh, gratis. I think at some point, but we're really just trying to find out what the the laws are so that we can make some of these available to either other midshipmen. Uh, we talked also about providing some to the ships themselves. So when midshipmen graduate from this course, they could take their game to their ship or uh, to their squadron. Uh, this game was one of the two Falklands. Uh, this was uh, Falklands during World War I. Uh, and this is Nick Kristoff, who was, who was assessing this game. Nick, Nick's over on the right-hand side. Uh, Sebastian? So the amount of wargaming experience in this one picture as for our playtesters for their final is really impressive. Uh, the one, uh, the gentleman on the left is Mitch Reed from a A5SW. He runs No Dice, No Glory, which is also a commercial wargaming site, but he's been a professional duty gamer for a long, long time and long time Air Force officer retired. And Nick Kristoff helped design the Naval War College's um, What's was it War C, right? Uh, War C um, module and game that they use up at the Naval War College for educational purposes. And these two were great uh, play testers and evaluators for this game, which was largely uh, an, a World War One Falklands engagement between the British um, and uh, German fleet uh, near the Falkland Islands. And as you see, that sort of cardboard uh, piece of green land represents the harbor uh, at the Falkland Islands, and the German ships are coming up that are blue uh, on blue blocks and they're coming up to engage either to destroy the radar station or to escape with their fleet. So early on, they're posed with this very sort of tactical question of what do I do? How do I allocate my forces uh, while they're, do I strike where they're still in Harbor, even though I'm outgunned and not matched or, um, or do I just make a run for it? And it really, it, Involves in very different ways and it's fantastic for the students and uh, the facilitators who, who played this game um, to really explore that, um, that problem set. Next slide. Thanks, Sebastian. Uh, oh, wait, I'm sorry. I had a second Queen of Pirates, but we'll go to the next slide then. I may have had two. Uh, this was the uh, Falklands 1982. And I think Sebastian and Marcus, I think this one might have been the one that changed the most because they realized that it was far too in intricate when they were starting. So they decided to simply focus on the air operations during the war. Is that correct? Well, not just air operations, uh, the resource allocation problem involved in, in planning and executing air operations. Um, I, 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 I'm not quite sure that the complexity per se of their original intent was unmanageable so much as it was unmanageable in the context of the time and the pacing of a game within the confines we had, the limitations we had. So this game did change probably the most throughout the course. They originally started this game off as a fighter to fighter engagement game where they were trying to model down to air combat to the plane. 
Um, and it was unsurprisingly given the skill set of the students, uh, of the midshipmen who were uh, math majors uh, and STEM majors. Um, and they, and the, I remember the first concept uh, for their design, they had a bunch of equations out and that they wanted their players to like fill out and do math. And I was like, I was like, this is questionable, uh, like player behavior that you assume that the, they, they will do this complex math for you. Um, so they they re, they took the uh, the insights and criticisms, but also some of their own learning as they play tested it to make it simpler, but also changed some of the key dynamics. So it, it shifted away from a fighter to fighter engagement in the Falklands 1982 conflict, as much uh, about sort of air power sort of uh, sortie and generation and worker placement mechanics, right, where you had to dedicate certain aircraft to certain missions over certain areas. Um, as you did so, those planes had to come back and be refueled and refitted. So that means they were outside, uh, they were unavailable for the next cycle. So you had to really manage the cycles as you produce these sort of uh, cycles over prolonged periods and time. And it can create windows of opportunity that the opposition can take advantage of. Um, so it was a really interesting game in that sort of worker placement uh, engine way. Excellent. Now, what we did realize is we can't do this alone, or we couldn't do it, Marcus, Sebastian, uh, because the, the demand was just too great for these. And so what we realized is we're going to have to develop a new crew of facilitators, of referees, of umpires to be able to manage these games. So the game we really decided to, to start with was War at Sea. Nick Kristoff came over for a day to instruct about uh, seven of the faculty members at the Naval Academy, again, not... I think there were, there was only one history professor there, uh, mathematics, leadership, et cetera. But they all found value in their own realms and disciplines uh, as to what this offered uh, to, to them. So there will be a series of training events for this core group of, of future facilitators and referees for using War at Sea. In this case, we, we did uh, Battle of Leyte Gulf. This is what, uh, sorry, War at Sea is what Nick Kristoff had developed up at Naval War College. Uh, and uh, they, they really got it. Uh, Sebastian or Marcus? No, I don't have anything to add to that. Okay. Sebastian, you good? Yep. Okay, next slide. And then there are other, other games. Uh, the one I like to use, uh, I started last semester with my midshipmen from the international class was uh, Shores of Tripoli. And Kevin had, had sent a, a copy to me to test out last summer, Marcus and I and uh, a professor from the mathematics department had play tested it. We went through a few iterations. And uh, in just a 50 minute class, I, the midshipmen had read the rules, but once they got through a couple of, of turns, they really started to apply. And actually, I kind of tested this out with one of my exams, and they tended to understand the, the uh, Tripoli War far better than, than midshipmen in previous semesters. Was this the only reason? I, I don't know, but it's really the only uh, different factor I, I had incorporated in my, my Naval History class. So it's not just that. What we learned, uh, the benefits of partnering, and that goes beyond, in our case, the Naval Academy. We really had to rely on people who had far more experience in this. We are not the leaders in wargaming, certainly. Uh, we are students, and we are willing to learn from anybody who's been there before us. Uh, and the Krulak Center, phenomenal again. Uh, the CIA brought a couple of, or sent a couple of their analysts to run two of their games for the midshipmen as well. We didn't have a photo of that for a variety of reasons. Uh, West Point and the Air Force Academy, we started discussing with them the possibility of having um, competitions uh, uh, between our military service academies. The second thing is you've really got to leverage assets. Uh, the, the museum doesn't have a lot, history department didn't have a lot, but what we found is as we started working together, not only between the two entities, but as we started working with professors around the yard, each provides something. You can't do it alone. So find those partners that have resources, share your resources with them, share your personnel with them. Uh, third is that uh, interest and demand from the students far exceeded the current supply. That's why we need uh, more professors working on this and uh, we'll see what happens in the future. Uh, but mostly educational benefit to the midshipmen was clear. Uh, they learned more. I think they learned better. 
Uh, now, I, I don't know if we'll be able to do any data analysis, Marcus, in the future, or you guys will, since I'm no longer at the Academy. But it'll be interesting to see if, if we can follow through with these initial midshipmen from the first uh, year or so and really carry things, things out, not only through their time at the Academy, but beyond. Uh, yeah, time will tell based on uh, how useful some of the initiative turns out to be to the core course if, if interested instructors have, um, they, take, they, take the, uh, they take advantage of the chance to have their midshipmen participate in games. They can see how those, those activities enhance their classroom teaching of certain topics in, in the core course. Um, I don't think there's much question that it encourages a kind of professional intellectual development on the part of the, the midshipmen that is, uh, it's unmistakable when you behold it. They have to learn to work together in teams effectively. They have to allocate tasks. They have to make decisions under different levels of stress and time constraints. Um, and they have to do so in a way that integrates lots of different kinds of knowledge together. Uh, it's, yeah, it's the quintessence of what we're trying to teach them. Yeah, I want to point out also that one of our mathematics professors who was at the war at sea training realized uh, very quickly, uh, because the game is largely played with, with uh, dice that, are, that, that um, reflect the capabilities of different uh, task groups. And he said, wait a minute, I can just design a course on, on my probabilities course using this particular game. So it's again, it's not just the history department or the political science department that can use these games. Uh, the leadership uh, folks who came over to uh, work with us that day quickly saw the opportunities of, of having midshipmen work together, trying to identify the mission, figuring out what the consequences would be for their actions, et cetera. Next slide. So that was the first year of this endeavor, particularly in a COVID environment. What is phase two? Number one is we need uh, another space. We're looking at uh, the basement of Mahan Hall, uh, a space that is currently uh, under the control of the history department and it would be a perfect space, uh, but due to uh, some construction, I think that may be delayed by about a year or so. The second is uh, we hope that there will be full-time staff beyond what is now a collateral duty or really a labor of love. Nobody, I wasn't assigned this duty. Marcus wasn't assigned this duty. We both took it on above and beyond what our normal work hours were because we believed in the, this opportunity for the midshipmen. And that's what it's about. We've got to remember every day in, in, in our world, uh, it's about the midshipmen and how we prepare them for the future, uh, whatever uh, community they belong to, whatever they, they go to beyond even uh, the Navy or Marine Corps. The third is uh, coordination of other, with other departments and incorporating this as a pedagogical tool at the academy and certainly uh, in training for uh, midshipmen. Uh, the, uh, we have one midshipman who aspires now. She really never wanted to be uh, have some sort of brigade leadership position. Uh, she wanted to do some other things but now she wants to be the training officer for the brigade of midshipmen. That is her goal. And part of it is she wants to incorporate wargaming as part of their training. Uh, she even had the idea of, of working with the YPs for, for those of you out of the Navy, it's that's the yard patrol craft. They look like sort of small warships without, without the weapons aboard or, uh, but- Very uh, small them, warships. Very small, <laughs> yeah. Uh, we use them for training in the Severn River and the Chesapeake. And sometimes at least we used to go out beyond the Chesapeake uh, along the Eastern seaboard, at least when I was doing it uh, as an officer in charge. Um, and then uh, begin a post-COVID schedule that includes these wargaming weekends and competitions with other colleges. And I think next year will be a very freeing opportunity for the ECA, for the class, for Marcus and Sebastian and everybody else, because you won't be under a lot of the restrictions and limitations that we had this past year and we'll have to, it won't be as much ad hoc and responding to the latest shutdown of the, of the academy, which was again, completely understandable. When there was an outbreak, you had to close things down, understandable. But beyond COVID, I think this, this really presents even more opportunities. Uh, Marcus, do you wanna talk anything about phase two since you are, gonna, you are still there, I am not. Well, I, I wasn't aware that, that there, were, there were rebuilding issues involved in in, in migrating to the space beneath Mahan Hall. There's a, I just found out last week. Yeah. Uh, that's interesting and possibly ominous because the state of disrepair that I found down there was actually uh, comfortably amenable to wargaming. 
<laughs> so, well, uh, they're not, no, they're going to be using that space for another department. Is I think when they're, uh, I think they're going to be working on building 105 or something. So they have to move some of the classrooms or something down yeah. to the space that we're looking at. Yeah, like an overflow space for a while so, or something like that. But uh, you know, this is going to succeed or fail based on on the willingness of other people to lean in. Um, and take up some of, of the responsibility for facilitating, um, making possible these kinds of activities for midshipmen. The, 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 the mids themselves under the capable leadership of the two third class, soon to be second class who are running the ECA, uh, the mids themselves carry most of the water uh, based on their enthusiasm and their natural organizational aptitude and, and their, their faith in what wargaming means for their development and for the, uh, the institution and the Navy. But, um, I, as, as Claude, I think, correctly iterated, uh, we, we, we can't do it without, without outside stakeholdership as well. There just isn't enough in the way of interest and resourcing at the academy. And, and with Claude's departure, I mean, there, there's support elsewhere uh, on the yard, and, and I think there's even enthusiasm. But, but that's almost invariably true when, when things seem to be net positive for everybody and, and nobody's asking for substantial resourcing or trade-offs. And they'll, they'll probably arrive a point at which, at which uh, somebody's going to have to trade time or trade opportunity cost or trade something off to, to make wargaming a, a firmer possibility or to build it into a, a more permanent aspect of how the midshipmen develop. And then we'll see, we'll see just how well we can defend it. Um, but it, it's like, like, we've, like we've emphasized up to this point, uh, it's, it's hard to exaggerate just how, how uh, favorable the reception among the midshipmen has been. And how how hopeful I think everybody legitimately can be that that it, it points to a, a, a really bright bright set of prospects coming up. And I don't think Marcus and I could could stress enough the role that Sebastian has played in this. We could not have done this without Sebastian's knowledge, his energy, his commitment, yeah. uh, and his network. Uh, if Cinderella uh, is wargaming, he is the fairy godmother. <laughs> So next slide, please. All right, it's time for your questions. Anything that we can answer? I hope we can. Uh, so we'll open it up. Sebastian? So I, uh, sorry. So the, this photo, which I love is from my first time at the museum when, uh, Claude was taking me around and I saw this, uh, <laughs> the sign and this big old box in the middle of the museum. And I, when I read it, I was like, this is going to be an awesome semester working with these guys. <laughs> um, but we'll start off with some questions first. The first question that I see is, are you setting any of these games within a larger strategic situation? For example, I once played a game set in 1914 as the Austrian ships intercepted a French force escorting troop ships from North Africa to Marseille. And Austri uh, the Austrians concentrated on troop ships but took more damage than the French, but the troop ships turned back and the French ships uh, and reinforcements to protect Paris weren't there when needed. So I think that large big question is, are, the, are we just looking at tactical vignettes within these games or are we looking at wider strategic operational considerations so as, as we play as this we game? Play it, in um, terms of the games I've used in class, uh, as, as we play it, no, we, we, work out, we work out the game according to the, the rules and the, the play dynamics built into the, but, but we, you, the, the game only has value insofar as you situate it in a broader context. And if if I'm using a game about Midway or something about from from the the Spanish American War or the the, the Mexican War of the, in the 1840s in a naval history course, we we speak extensively both before and after about about the interrelationship between tactical and operational affairs and and the broader strategic context. I'd be a terrible instructor if we didn't. Um, I've used war games a couple of times in German history, uh, one pertaining to the Eastern Front, a very localized look at one part of Kursk that was years ago, and, and we talked about the, the broader strategic problems the Germans faced on the Eastern Front and, and the problems in 1943 with undertaking uh, offensive initiative. Um, yes, but that, that isn't necessarily a function of the game. It, it's a function of how well 
an instructor makes use of that game to 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 achieve broader course objectives. It, it, we 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 are, after all, a, we're we're an academy, and everything we do is mission focused on developing the midshipman, morally and intellectually, in this case, uh, historically, but but this is a pedagogical undertaking first and foremost. Yeah, another part of that I would suggest is we have to be careful about the time that is allotted to midshipmen. Their schedule is really tight. To be able to find a few hours, a couple hours at night or a few hours on the weekend is extremely difficult. So we have to go into the games with the understanding that it can't be anything so complex that it requires you know, a six to eight hour playing period. We generally looked at about four hours as a max for any of the games. And that's really, that's really pressing it because even on Saturdays, they may have requirements like attending a football, they're, they're all required to attend a fo the football games. So they may not be available on that particular day. Um, so I think some of the, the, the larger games that you're talking about, geez, I don't think we could even do X, uh, geez, uh, could we even do squad leader? I don't think we could. I think we could if we if we could spool it up really quickly out of the box. You know, yeah. if you'd have to have like War at Sea. Uh, War at Sea is a fairly complex game that requires expert facilitation, and yeah. and it can be done in three hours, roughly. You know, I mean, crudely, but it it you 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 really have to have somebody in the driver's seat and, clearly and who knows what again. they're doing. I mean, when we did Fletcher yeah. Pratt's game, uh, the second time the midshipmen played it, it was much faster pace. And that so. plays to the issue of, of building a, a, a robust culture of wargaming. The more wargaming we do, the greater the number of people who participate and are involved, the more experience they accrue, the more readily, I think, these kinds of undertakings will, 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 will be able to be pulled off. Yeah. yeah, and for, again, fortunately, we have those two very energetic young midshipmen. Uh, they have about a, a, a list of about 120 midshipmen who are interested in this uh, and have started participating. We've had to turn back midshipmen on some of our games because we just had too many people who, were, who wanted to play, but we couldn't accommodate. We hope to do that in the future. John, or, I, sorry, I see your Marcus. question there. Uh, did you play any operational level games that were long enough to replicate campaigns? And I have not, unless you count a, a truncated version of Midway to be a campaign. So um, to, just to jump in about the strategic context question is um, many of our games tend to be focused by the class, uh, like any good designer, or any uh, educator has to be constrained by their time with their students, their contact hours, the availability of their students, but also the knowledge of their of our students, right? Remembering our the midshipmen are not SWOs yet, right? Uh, they have not pinned on. Uh, so their level of knowledge is uh, still budding, right? They're still growing it and our job is to help nurture that, but also connected back to the class. But um, there are some exceptions where we do provide like a wider strategic picture. Like for example, when we do our general quarters games, there are usually strategic based uh, objectives, right? That by X turn, the reinforcements will show up by X. This is why you need to stop these ships because they're doing critical supply runs to Russia, right? Uh, for our Assassin's Mace game that we mentioned earlier uh, for the uh, nine dash line, the first early turns are largely sort of crisis management and competition as they're jockeying for position in the theater uh, as each side has different strategic imperatives and constraints laid upon them, right? Like for instance, we tell the US side in that scenario that they can't fire first, right? So they have to work under this sort of ambiguous, will the Chinese shoot this turn or not and be prepared, but also not uh, be so escalatory that the Chinese feel like they have to shoot, right? Um, so there's that kind of context and it really depends on the time and availability uh, of the game and of our students and our facilitators. Uh, moving on to the next question I have is, <laughs> um, let's see, <laughs> Mike Dunn wants to ask, are any of the mis uh, midshipmen ambitious enough to take on uh, a minis version of Harpoon, right? thinking back to Larry Bond's old game um, back, what, in the 80s and 90s? And he just issued a new version, Harpoon 4, right, Claude? I heard about that, but I have not played it. Uh, would they be interested? 
Yeah, I, I, because I found they've, they've oh, yeah. been interested in every game that we've we've presented to them and more. They're always interested in games that 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 purport to have something to do with things they think they're supposed to know. You know? Uh, and as un- untutored as they are, as Sebastian pointed out, uh, uh, they are they're also very eager. And for the most part, they're they're eager to be better naval and Marine Corps officers. So if you give if you give them the tools to do that, they're they're going to jump on the opportunity and try to take full advantage of it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the next question is, did the Falklands air game, which I'm assuming the 1982 game, include the air defense component from the ships, uh, especially? Um, I'll briefly answer this question. So the Falklands game was, like I said, largely a sortie generation worker placement mechanic where they had to manage the, the tempo um, and logistics concerns of generating enough aircraft for the, the missions that they were had to do to win the game, right? Uh, so air defense and uh, ground combat and actual air-to-air combat was abstracted to, um, they still use math, but they baked it into combat result tables. Uh, and yes, air defense was baked into the math that went into the tables. Uh, the hardest part for the Argentinian side was actually finding the carriers and the ship formations um, like it was in, uh, in, the, in the war. They spent a lot of time spending air, sending aircraft to go search for where the, uh, for the carriers were um, and then trying to find a massive enough uh, firepower to find and kill the carrier, which was one of their wing conditions. But often the carrier would also try to evade and move by time they try to send the next sortie out, right? Um, yeah, what a great lesson for them to learn in the modern age. You know, it makes the Falklands such an interesting, uh, an interesting campaign historically. So did you have... Um, did you have any of the students came, uh, come into this playing commercially popular games such as Warhammer 40K and Flames of War? Uh, Marcus uh, and I can probably address that. Those specifically, no. no, or not that I know of, possibly, yeah. but I don't think so. Yeah, so I know one group was heavily influenced by Warhammer 40K to the oh. point that most of their rule set was borrowed from uh, Warhammer 40K in the beginning. <laughs> um, and this only shows you that, you know what I mean, the students pull from their ex- experiential knowledge, right? We're humans that way. Um, so they pull from the game they loved and liked, uh, and which was uh, Warhammer 40K. And they eventually found that it doesn't fit all, everything they needed for their historical game. And they adapted it and they looked at different games and looked at different um, sort of uh, problem sets, but they did borrow from the games they knew and played and they, the ones they, they learned to uh, know and play during the course. Um, is there a path for midshipmen, uh, for the midshipmen develop tactics, strategies, et cetera, with these games to go to the larger Navy? Is there ever a time when something is discovered like, wow, no one ever thought about this? Um, Claude, Marcus, I hand that off to you. Not, not at our level and not with the games that we were doing now. That would primarily fall under Naval War College. Marcus, I mean, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I don't think we're doing any kind of lessons learned from, from the Naval History games, uh, certainly. Uh, go ahead. No, no, the War College has that Title X responsibility to, to develop concepts and to test them and do assessment, things like that. We don't, this is a pedagogical institution and I'm not quite sure what you could hope to do with uncommissioned officer candidates anyway. Um, they, they're, they're not raw material testable enough for anything you generate to be valid. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I, I'm afraid not, no. So as, uh, as I wait for other questions to sort of flow into the chat and uh, sort of um, continue the discussion, I have a couple of questions that were sent to me via email that I wanted to ask you guys for those who could not attend is, um, could you explain a little bit more about uh, what you hope to this, this la- the lab and the, the wider Wargaming Initiative to grow into at the yard for both Claude and Marcus, if you guys had the resources and all the, the whole Red Sea open for you, where would you want it to go, right? <laughs> uh, wow, yeah, that's that has uh, been a subject for that Marcus and I have addressed many times over the past year. Uh, we know that there are senior officers who have told us that, hey, we wish this would have been here for us because the first time we ever did any kind of wargaming, uh, you know, in one case, I was a, he said, I was a captain. And by then it was too late when I went to war college. So we're just really, number one, trying to provide a baseline understanding of how war game, what war games are, how they function, 
the different uh, kinds of designs they may find out there so that when they are 04s, 05s, and they're going to the Naval War College, it's not a completely new experience. They, they at least have a jump up on other people. But also, when they are out in the fleet, if they're a SWO, for example, that this kind of thinking about, about uh, tactics and operations really start, they really start incorporating the lessons a lot more quickly as they're, they're developing as, uh, especially surface warfare officers or, or pilots, and understanding what they're doing uh, in a very abbreviated uh, time. Uh, we'd like them learning more from uh, other experts, whether they're active duty or reserves. A lot of the reserves may not have a lot of time on ships, uh, but they have experience at NRO or ONI or um, you know, elsewhere in the Pentagon or even in the business world, and as court, people in the corporate world have a lot of understanding of logistics. Uh, so maybe that's something that the midshipmen can take away from this as well. So we're really trying to find different ways for midshipmen to learn, learn their what eventually will be their trade. And, uh, you know, Marcus and I certainly on, on the side of we want them prepared for any potential future conflict. And if thinking better than another side works, then we will have succeeded in, in uh, giving them that baseline. Yeah, I'll amplify that. It isn't a very sexy or interesting answer, maybe, but wargaming matters in the contemporary military. It's mattered for a long time. It, it, it goes through, you know, uh, peaks and troughs, and, and I suppose it, it's ascending a peak now, or perhaps it's peaked and is beginning to descend. I, I can't can't judge. Um, but but it's more prominent now than I recall it having been in the discourse of the Navy over the last 20 years, 25 years. And I don't understand how how an institution like this, if I could take a, a, a slightly critical tack, I don't understand how an institution like this, in view of how low tech how straightforwardly accessible these kinds of resources and activities are. How low cost. It's low cost, yeah. How, how it can fail to develop the midshipmen along these lines in emphasis, with an emphasis on the kinds of cognitive aptitudes and, and, and abilities that wargaming enhances and draws on prepare them better to do those kinds of things because everybody has to have some familiarity with wargaming on that level of officership and decision making where it really starts to count and if you're not conversant with it even critically so then its potential and limitations are I, 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 either a lot less apparent or, or become problematic you know I, I i've talked to a marine a senior marine officer not long ago who was adamantly anti-war gaming who had war gamed uh on in in jpme years before and had determined that there wasn't anything war gaming demonstrated to his mind that wasn't better pursued out in, in other ways and he, he, he summed it up he said i've never seen a i've never seen a plan i've never seen a concept i've never seen an assessment that war gaming made better and that's a perfectly fair criticism but it it, or it, it may be I, I it may be completely wrong but the point is at least there's the basis for a conversation an informed discourse about it some familiarity with it as as both a tool with potential and limitations and it's something i feel like we urgently need to be doing because the united states in this strategic moment is more vulnerable uh faces greater challenges against a potential opponent more adept larger more innovative than arguably any the United States has ever faced. And we'll never get our arms around the intellectual scope of the problem if, if our officers and decision makers aren't adept at the kind of analysis that Wargaming gives you the tools to do better. That's, that's how I see it, fundamentally. Um, that, yeah, it, that, it, it's, really, it's really fundamental to me that way. Um, I'm not sure what else I can add to that. So uh, shifting little pivots to sort of more gaming at the yard or is what are some of the challenges you guys face as you guys are trying to stand up this initiative? Apathy. <laughs> can you expand on that a little bit, Marcus? Uh, you know, it, 
uh, there isn't a lot of familiarity with wargaming, um, either in, in, in its current instanti instantiations uh, in the military or the joint staff or in, you know, in a senior decision making level. There's just not a, a lot of familiarity with it. The Naval Academy is a bit of a backwater for the Navy anyway. Um, and there was kind of curiosity, I suppose, on one, one, in one sense. Oh, wargaming, that sounds very interesting. Uh, is this, you know, kind of playing battleship or uh, moving ships around on a, on, a, on a model of the Pacific Ocean and so on and so forth? Or is it computer gaming is the more typical question. That's, uh, you know, I, yes, of course, I've played computer games. That sounds like a lot of fun to do together with uh, my peers or um, apathy and kind of a, a benign indulgence in the idea of it um it, it again that, i think in general you find folks to be indulgent up to the point at which they have to take time and make an effort and and that's that's true of, of a lot of things yeah and and fortunately uh the resources were available from the museum yeah uh, and without that nothing would have happened but but even then you you find i, I think there was more support from faculty than anywhere else, because then you run into real bureaucratic blockades that we really just had to, we just really had to drive a truck through. And even then, you know, all the truck got four flat tires as, as we were storming through. And uh, that, that was, that was the most difficult and frustrating part of it, that we knew we could get to where we wanted to be. We had the resources and sometimes it was just a stroke of a pen and 10 minutes of somebody's time that they wouldn't take to, you know, change a, to modify a contract that could have been changed in 10 minutes. I'll, I'll leave it at that. Yeah. But there, but yeah. there was also, but, but there was also uh, a lot of support. I know when we briefed the soup, we briefed the soup twice, very supportive of the effort. He recognized the value of it. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so it, it, it was spotty, but you're going to find that in any bureau bureaucracy. We have a superintendent with with deep experience uh, in different parts of the Navy. He he'd once worked for Jim Mattis, General Mattis. Uh, he'd worked for Admiral Richardson. He 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 was familiar with some of the more dynamic, uh, professional, forward thinking officers who, who who've graced the naval services over the last twenty years. And when you talk about wargaming to somebody who's been around the block like that, they understand immediately what you're talking about and the value of it. And and I, I think he was, without showing it overly, a little incredulous that that we were bringing this to him like it was something new. <laughs> like, you know, this is something that should be going on. Yeah, he, he surprised recognized that it wasn't going on. Immediately, absolutely recognized it. Yeah. yeah. And others who were not practitioners didn't. And that's okay, too. They just, again, uh, Sebastian, you were talking about the midshipmen basing all of their decisions uh, on experiences. It's the same thing for administrators. If they don't know something, if it's not in their past, if they're not, uh, if they have, if they haven't served in the military, they may not understand it as much as somebody else who has. Well, that's on us. I mean, it's on us to demonstrate yeah. its value, to provide proof of concept, and 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 to to give them something that they can look at and go, oh, I see, that that is a value that is worthwhile. That makes that makes the investment of time and energy. Yeah, I, I would very much like uh, to present a paper, there, there should be something out there on what China's doing. Are they training their mid, their equivalent, excuse me, equivalent of midshipmen in wargaming? Do they, what, what value do they have on it? What investments are they making on it early on in their midshipmen or cadets careers? I don't know. Uh, I don't know if that information is out there. I think, uh, actually, I think I did run into somebody who was studying that issue last year. Um, but that would be something interesting to show our side. It's like, okay, it, it, I'll, I'll give you an example. Uh, when I was director of the museum, a couple of years ago, I was giving a tour of the museum to a very senior uh, Chinese uh, PLAN officer. Uh, he was a vice admiral. And we, we just happened to stop off at the Spanish-American War exhibit, and I was showing him a video monitor of the Battle of, of Manila Bay. And in the battle, there's, there's a scene, oh, sorry, there's text at the bottom of the scene, and uh, that explains what's going on, and all of a sudden, the admiral through his the, the admiral starts speaking. The translator then is translating, 
And then after uh, about 30 seconds, I realized what was happening. I was looking at the text. The translator was about five seconds ahead of what was happening during the Battle of Santiago, which meant that the Admiral was 10 seconds ahead of what was going on. So had no idea what was going on on screen. So finally I stopped it and I asked him through the translator. I said, the Admiral understands Manila Bay. And he said very proudly through his translator, yes, I studied it extensively at my, at my war college. And that became one of my aha moments. And I tell my midshipmen, or I told them my midshipmen that at the beginning of every semester, that your, your peer competitors, the folks who have uh, almost, if not more ships than you right now, they understand this. Uh, so can we apply that to war gaming as well? What do we know about what they're doing? And again, I'm, I haven't studied the issue. So maybe one of you uh, who are watching this will be able to explain that to us and help us to show the value of, of war gaming to very uh, junior officers or non or those who have yet to commission. Yeah, I, I see this this remark from John. It's it's really it's great to see a familiar name, I, which I can match to a face that I recall very fondly as a colleague in the history department. John, you're 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 much missed, and your departure is much lamented. Uh, there is an so there was a gaming club, and it was as I understand it, primarily Dungeons and Dragons before about a year ago. And uh, the two third class midshipmen who launched the extracurricular activity, uh, uh, Jen Sun and Jacob Haviland Dolores, uh, they have, they've built a, a, a specifically wargaming uh, ECA extracurricular club uh, around, around this concept. And um, they've, done, they've done just extraordinary things to, to, to bring, as I understand, well over 100 midshipmen into the fold. And, and they're working energetically and assiduously to, to set up game opportunities for as many of them as possible. And, you know, it's all, it's all a faculty member with a family and other responsibilities like me to do is just try to fan the flames of enthusiasm and provide the opportunities. You know, ultimately, they're doing exactly what has to be done. That's to carry, carry the torch. So to interject uh, briefly to Claude's comment about you know, what, what are the Chinese doing in wargaming? What are our competitors doing? Um, there's very little, very little known about Russian wargaming. Uh, we know uh, a good amount uh, of our uh, allies and partners like the UK has its Fight Club and DSTL. Australia is doing a very big push at its own uh, defense college uh, around uh, educational gaming. And they did a great series called The Forge. Uh, on their website, uh, on their journal website called The Forge on educational wargaming. In terms of the Chinese, it's pretty interesting because, and I'm not a foremost um, scholar in this, if you want more about Chinese wargaming in this space, go talk, uh, go find Mike Bond at RAN and Elsa Kania up at Harvard. Uh, they're doing some amazing research into this region, um, uh, translating texts, but also doing some original research in this area. Uh, but one of the things that, that was really interesting is that they're doing university level sponsored games, but through the PLA uh, annually um, in a way to both as a recruiting tool, but also as a way to get people to start thinking um, um, about their own province, problem sets, right? So, which is a fast, uh, very interesting thing to see from uh, China as well. But as we move to other questions, please put your questions in the chat and I'll get to them in a bit. Um, so for Marcus and Claude, what did you guys learn personally as you guys did this initiative and uh, uh, does this whole semester of you know, COVID and, uh, and everything else? Marcus, you want to go first or you want me to? I'm still trying to figure out what I've learned. Uh, I will say that I, I didn't learn this, but it validated what I have seen for 16 years among midshipmen. They are far more capable and far more creative than many people may give them credit for. Yes, they are 18, 19, 20, 21 year olds, uh, but they're smart, they're create, they, they want to learn uh, in a different way. Uh, you know, the, the, traditional, the traditional book learning may not be there or the traditional lectures, but there is a hunger for understanding what they do. They know why they're at the academy for the most part. There, there are always those outliers. Uh, so I think it validated the fact that these midshipmen, I would, I would, I look forward to them being Navy and Marine Corps officers. Um, and I don't think I learned anything new about uh, bureaucracies in in trying to. I did initiate. 
I've worked in more bureaucracies, I think, than, Mark, than Marcus has. I work at Naval Intelligence and a few other places and a de for defense contractor. So you just tend to see these. It's just you understand that there is a bureaucracy, that there are some middle managers who may try to hinder uh, progress, and you try to work around that. And it's understandable. It's just human nature. Uh, it, it, there's no you know, fault on them. It's just how it is. You just find ways around them and, and, and such. Um, so yeah, I, I think the fact that the midshipmen could pick these concepts up so quickly, whatever game they were playing was enlightening. Let them run with it, is what I say. Let's help them learn in a way that they enjoy learning. And to go back to that initial quote, don't let them know they're learning. It's more sustaining for me. I'm not sure if I've learned a lot. Um... It's refreshing to have a chance to interact with the midshipmen in ways uh, less than typical. I've been at the academy for for uh, 16 years now, and there's a grim predictability to the rhythm of faculty life. You teach the same or similar courses year in and year out for the most part. You, know, you can develop some new ones now and then. Uh, the midshipmen, they never really change. I guess they change generationally and very gradually, but you get older and older year by year as a faculty member, and they're the same age every year. They're always 18 to 22. They're always bright and young and full of energy and, and, and potential. And, and, and it's easy to mark your own accelerating decrepitude as a faculty member, as a person, when you're, when you're consistently around young people. Uh, having a chance to do something different with them, uh, to to develop a different kind of, I mean, to take an off-the-shelf capability, so to speak, and to try to apply it to the environment of the Naval Academy and the midshipmen I've come to know so well, that's been, that's been sustaining. It's exciting and invigorating and vitalizing to do it. Um, yeah, I, I'm not sure that I've learned a lot yet. Uh, I've learned more about bureaucracy than I thought I wanted to, but I, I, I follow Claude with that. I don't know why a senior administrator, when something like this drops on their desk and, and somebody seeking a workaround, would give it at all an indulgent perspective. I mean, there's nothing, if, if there's no familiarity with it, there's nothing, there's no reason to bend any rule or to try to get things done. It's just another annoyance. And again, it's, it's kind of on us to figure out how to demonstrate its value and to convince people that it, it really belongs here. Yeah. yeah, and if you believe in something, you, you do what it takes to, to accomplish that mission. Um, you know, I think Mark and I could probably tell many stories about that. When I was on active duty, the academy uh, had experience like that with the pipes and drums, but uh, we won't go into that for tonight. But again, it was just something that, that demonstrated that if you open up the aperture for the midshipmen, if you allow their creativity and their intelligence to emerge, they will not fail you and they will exceed expectations. So, uh, and I think that we can probably carry that on to other uh, service academies and other, other colleges and other, other groups of young people. So uh, the midshipmen have always given me, given me hope. Um, I, I have faith in them and I, I and we're very grateful that I had my 16 years uh, teaching at the academy uh, alongside them and with midship and with uh, Marcus. So. so on that hopeful and aspiring note, Claude, I will end with our customary question that we ask all of our speakers in our series this year, which is um, un unrestricted uh, by money, time, institutional politics, whatever, right? What is one game for you guys that you guys would want to design or get designed for you at the U.S. Naval Academy? Uh, for both you and uh, Marcus, you guys can offer different perspectives and sort of why, right? Why, why do you want or need that kind of game? What would be one game that we would want to have designed for us? Is that yep. the question? Yep. <laughs> I would I would like to have a game a game that that represents with a high degree of historical fidelity the uh, the contingency involved in 
sorting out the fate of the Weimar Republic between 1929 and 19 late 32 or, or, or early 33. You know, call it call it sort of from the death of Stresemann to to maybe February 1933. I'd love to have a political war game. This is kind of a, a tasking for John Prados if he's out there listening to this without necessarily being a part of, of the Zoom feed. Please design this game for me. It's what I spend a lot of time trying to figure out how best to represent in my classes. For me, I would like to see a game that extends the War of 1812 into 18, well into 1817. Because by then you have, and having the, uh, Robert Fulton had uh, built the Demologos, the first steam uh, propelled warship in the world. Uh, we had our ships of the line, first ships of the line that were, were, were coming off the ways that were not yet there in time for, for the War of 1812. I would like to have seen a, a battle between U.S. and British uh, forces that on the U.S. side includes ships of the line frigates and uh, a few of those uh, steam-powered uh, double-held uh, boats. And if you look at the Demologos, it was an interesting design, two hulls, and it had the steam, uh, the, the uh, the, the propeller, sorry, uh, the paddle wheel. Sorry, it's been a long day. Paddle wheel, which was uh, it was a center line paddle wheel. It could have gone forward, backward. So I think a war, war of 18, 1812 into 1817 would, would be what happens when you get the technology and the large ships out there. Does it matter when you've had a very experienced British fleet already operating? Does uh, a few extra ships or a few ships with a greater technology matter? Yeah, I love that. I love both those ideas. I think those would be great. And for those designers out there in our Zoom room and watching at, on our YouTube channel, uh, get designing. Um, but I would like to take this time to thank Claude and Marcus for spending their Tuesday evenings with us discussing about their awesome work that they're doing at the Naval Yard. Um, and it personally for myself, this was my first time teaching at the U.S. Naval Academy, and it was absolute honor and a pleasure to work with these guys they were top class and you know what i mean they 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 mentioned a lot of your know, hardships about your know, navigating the naval academy for me it was nothing it was like i just talked to claude and marcus and, and they were fantastic so it was always awesome to have them um as uh colleagues and mentors and also just collaborators in this grand scheme of ours but thank you again claude and marcus and we hope to can have I, you guys can I thank everybody soon. for those of yeah. you who uh took the time and uh, out of your your evenings to, to sit and hear us talk about this and uh, ask so many great questions and to contribute to the chat feed. Uh, it's really nice to think about how many interested people there are out there and the idea that what we're doing fits into a broader community. So far, uh, and primarily, I think, through the wonderful vector that Sebastian is as the fairy godmother of USNA Wargaming. Uh, so far, it's been absolutely inspiring to encounter as much support and enthusiastic, um, I've used the term before this evening, but I'll say it again, stakeholdership on the part of the broader wargaming community out there, especially in DC, but not just. Um, thank you all for coming out here this evening. It's really nice. All right, and for that, uh, I'd like to end on a good note and thank you everyone for spending your time with us. And thank you again, and lastly to Claude and Marcus.